Well, welcome everyone. This is the Crisis Jam episode 197. You can believe that. Uh, and we are going to hear today uh, around partnerships driving innovation. Such a great topic. And we've got three amazing speakers, both from Pew Charitable Trust, as well as Clear Pathways, uh, Julie Worthmeyer, Alicia Smith, and Cal Jenkins. So before we get into that uh, featured presentation, let's go through um, including where you can find all of the information, including how to sign up for the jam, and that's at talk.crisisnow.com. So you can register, get weekly reminders, get very cool uh, virtual backgrounds. And I also just want to note that the uh, under video and materials, when you go to view materials, you can access old PowerPoints, uh, you can see old crisis um, hot seat questions, uh, data corners goes all the way back to the beginning of the jam. If you can believe that uh, to 2020, almost five years ago that we have been building this community. So thank you for being a part of that. So you can uh, see that we have it broken out by section. Uh, you can easily watch the last jam, which I often do. Uh, you can see uh, the videos that we showcase, questions, workforce strategies, everything, one-stop shop, talk.crisisnow.com. Make sure that you share that with your colleagues. So switching over to news, uh, we did want to share, this was recently uh, cross-posted on NPR, 988 crisis hotline counselors are sometimes targeted by sexually abusive counsel, uh, callers. So this is something that we are aware of. And when I say we, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Laura Evans, and I'm the AVP for Public Policy and Government Affairs with Vibrant Emotional Health. Vibrant is the administrator of the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. So we are very aware of this issue um, that faces some crisis counselors. Let me see before I spend uh, too much time talking myself. Let me see if we have Shy Lewis here or if we have our friends from Lines for Life here who want to speak to this, uh, both Shy uh, was featured in this article uh, because it is something that we do take very seriously and we do have training uh, available to help crisis counselors face this, but no one should have to face being sexually uh, abused or inappropriate content while they are at work. Shy here. Doesn't look like she's joined us just yet. Uh, but please do check out this article. Um, and if you do have any questions, if you have something to report, or maybe you have experienced um, a negative encounter or had a negative experience on the 988 Lifeline, we want to make sure that we are doing some quality improvement. So I will put a link in the chat uh, for how you can um, uh, reach out to our quality improvement team. Am I missing someone who's ready to speak on that? All right, let's move forward. Uh, Hennepin County, that is the county uh, that represents uh, Minneapolis in Minnesota, has just okayed $15 million for a youth crisis stabilization um, uh, a unit. So this is very important. Uh, we know that kids definitely need a safe place to go, a soft landing that is not uh, juvenile uh, delinquent facilities, which are um, often not the best place for them to receive the help they need. So uh, in lieu of that, uh, the county is expediting a project for $15 million focusing on youth. But again, I think they are utilizing federal funds um, from COVID supplements and others. So again, it's really important uh, to think about sustainable funding. So that's something that I'm often thinking about uh, in the government affairs side of things at Vibrant. Uh, but also want to share when counties are doing great work. So love to see this and let's ensure that they have sustainable funding and funding for other counties to replicate. So with that, we are moving forward to the crisis trivia hot seat. Uh, right now, we do not have a volunteer, so I'm going to do a call uh, for volunteers. If you'd like to volunteer, please raise your hand. And I will go to the first hand that I see. Uh, if not, we can do this as a collective. Anybody want to volunteer for the crisis hot seat? If you volunteer, you do get a hat uh, or shirt, whatever you'd like. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands, so I am going to go and make this a, a collective trivia question. Uh, and this is around NextGen 911. Um, 
So next to 911, it's an initiative to modernize the existing 911 emergency communication system. Uh, and they will do that by transitioning from analog to digital IP based infrastructure. Oh, I'm sorry, I think we might have skipped ahead. Well, let's keep going. Um, so Next Gen 911, essentially taking the existing system and giving it an, an upgrade so that we are using digital internet based protocols for the new uh, infrastructure for people to reach 911. This upgrade better aligns with contemporary technology, uh, communication technologies. So the question for everyone here, thank you, is what is the primary advantage of implementing Next Gen 911? So why is 911 upgrading their system to this new IP-based um, protocol? Is it for lower wait times, adding text and videos, reducing overall cost, or ease for increasing number of call operators? Anyone wanna put what they're thinking in the chat? Anyone wanna talk us through what they may be considering as you answer this one? That's got a lot. Okay, we've got Jessica mentioning E. None of the above. She thinks it's to increase rel reliability. That that's a good. That's actually a good point. Um, but I think there's one that is one that um, our nine one one public safety answering point partners are really highlighting as a primary advantage. Uh, so I'm sure reliability is definitely a, a, an advantage, but there's one that's a primary. Let's see. Do we have the results of the poll? All right. We've got 51% of people saying adding text and, and video, 25% saying lower wait times, 9% reducing overall cost. <laughs> Excuse me. 15% for ease of uh, increasing number of call operators. I'm seeing folks thumbs up your comment, Jessica, uh, for E, uh, Jamie uh, saying supporting moving from digital uh, to digital from analog. Let's see what the correct answer is here. We've got most of the audience saying B. You guys are right. We couldn't stump you. Uh, so modernizing 911 includes multimedia communication enhance location accuracy and integrated data sharing. So the case for recognizing 911 operators as first responders likely to gain some momentum with these advantages. And certainly, as you can imagine, um, maybe easier sometimes to send a, a text uh, in an unsafe situation or video, video pictures, images of an emergency so that can better inform uh, those 911 operators and how to better assist. So we can stump you. Good job, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if we can get everyone a hat or a shirt, but if you are interested in volunteering for the hot seat, you do get one of those. So thank you. It is accessible for the deaf population. Thank you, Dana. It's so important that these services are accessible for everyone. It's another good question. We couldn't get you, um, but just appreciate you all participating. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to start our featured presentation and I'm gonna hand it first to Julie Wertheimer. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, my name is Julie Wertheimer and I lead our behavioral health uh, and criminal justice work at the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Pew, um, we do make grants, but in addition to grant making, um, we both fund and provide technical assistance, research uh, in a number of areas, both domestic policy and internationally on environmental issues. I, of course, am in the domestic policy portfolio. Um, and since 2020, uh, Pew's Mental Health and Justice Project uh, has conducted research and worked with local stakeholders and policymakers to examine behavioral health and crisis care practices across the country. As many of you know all too well, far too many people in crisis often end up in emergency departments or local jails, 
while we know that behavioral health, a behavioral crisis is largely a locally addressed issue, uh, we've come to learn and believe states have an important role to play in making sure there's access to behavioral health care, no matter who you are, where you live, or where you are when you're experiencing a crisis. So we've been working with state leaders, local officials, and national experts across the country to identify policies that can improve outcomes for individuals experiencing behavioral health crises. One of the ways we achieve our work is by working with organizations that operate at both the state and local level, such as the PEGS Foundation, um, from which Clear Pathways comes, and you'll hear about in a second. We've been partnering with PEGS since uh, 2021. PEGS is a part of our Behavioral Health Emergency Response Initiative uh, that's hosted by and facilitated by the Marin Institute at NYU uh, and works to identify and advance state policy changes and create plans for potential future investments uh, in Texas, Ohio, and Michigan. Uh, this initiative spans both public safety and healthcare systems uh, and aims to reduce the likelihood that a call to an emergency hotline involving a person experiencing a behavioral health emergency results in someone being physically harmed, arrested, or brought to an emergency department uh, when not necessary, and increases the likelihood that such a call results in a person being connected to effective community-based behavioral health services. I'm so grateful to be joined by Alicia Smith and Cal Jenkins from PEGS who have been leading this important work with us in Ohio. Their Clear Pathways initiative is, is conducting, excuse me, a 911-988 standard operating procedures pilot that I'm really excited for all of you to hear about today. And with that, I would like to pass it over to Alicia. Thanks, Julie. Good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, so PEGS Foundation is based in Hudson, Ohio, and we are graciously thankful for our founding partners with PEX Foundation and our additional funding partners uh, from Pew Charitable Trusts and, and other funders. Our focus is on adults experiencing behavioral health crises, and our goal is to make sure that when an individual does experience a, a behavioral health crisis, they have a clear path to receiving person-centered help. Our goal is not only to achieve this uh, aim in Ohio, but also across the nation. Next slide. And the way we want to do our work is to collaborate with local, state, and national partners, not only to accelerate the implementation of best practices, but to make sure that there's awareness of the challenges associated with individuals ultimately relying on hospitals and jails as de facto systems for uh, receiving help in a crisis emergency. Next slide. We do our work in four key areas, um, measurement and evaluation, statewide field building, prototype sites, and financing policies. Measurement and evaluation is an underpinning across all of the work that we do. Um, we firmly believe that what isn't measured cannot be changed. And our goal is to make sure that in all of our efforts, we have an understanding of the problem to be solved. Um, far too often, we end up embarking on solutions that result in the thing to do without any understanding of the baseline, uh, the evidence to substantiate the existence of a problem and any awareness of whether we've solved the problem or in fact exacerbated it or had no effect whatsoever. Um, so measurement and evaluation is an area that we use to understand the overall effect of clear pathways, but also to understand the effect of the work that we do across our other program areas. Statewide field building is an example of the work we do to lift up an awareness of emerging and evidence-based practices to provide an opportunity for peer and collaborative sharing. Um, we find that there are a lot of emerging experts in the field of behavioral health emergency or crisis, as you'll hear me say interchangeably. And we wanna make sure that rather than having folks make an individual one-off connections to people who are doing places in Ohio or North Carolina or Arizona or wherever they are, that we have a place that those folks can come to learn together. We do that also through Lunch and Learns uh, that we host monthly and have been doing for the past couple of years, and more recently conducted some learning collaborative with uh, distinct groups of individuals who might be experiencing some of the same challenges. Uh, for example, we recently wrapped a learning collaborative of our Ohio Association of County Behavioral Health Authorities, um, especially related to their a um, huge infusion of funds to create capacity for behavioral health emergency services and helping them understand from each other and from experts across the nation what some of the uh, 
opportunities were to overcome some of the challenges they were experiencing. Prototype sites, I won't do a huge spoiler alert here because Cal's gonna talk about an exciting area of uh, work that we've been prototyping. Actually, the pilot itself started last year, but the work, the groundwork for this started in uh, early uh, 2021. But that's where we test what we think might have legs for the future to sustain. But uh, consistent with our approach around measurement and evaluation, we also firmly believe in testing out strategies, deciding and understanding the impact, and then making adjustments and ideally uh, promoting them at scale. And then finally, financing policies is an area where we use to promote opportunities to make different uh, policies for payment of behavioral health emergency services. Uh, typically, there is a reliance on how other states do things um, or how uh, states have done it all along and without any regard to what might be necessary for uh, creating change in a certain area, especially when we're talking about 24-7 uh, accessibility, um, rural considerations, things for high and uh, low population needs. So our goal really is to transform how behavioral health emergency services are paid for. And hopefully that's another area we can come back to a, a future crisis jam and talk about some successes in that space. Next slide. So what we believe is that all in the entire crisis system should offer not only someone to call, someone to come and a place to be safe, but also facilitate the identification of needs at the beginning on an ongoing basis and make sure that there's an endpoint for post-stabilization follow-up, post-crisis follow-up, to make sure that this uh, cyclical pattern does not persist. Um, the, our preference, our, our desire is that we minimize those least preferred pathways throughout this care uh, continuum and reduce the number of the gold bars that you see that represent least preferred. Uh, acceptable is okay, but what we want to try to achieve is optimal care. And what you'll hear a little bit about today when Cal speaks is the work that we've been doing in that local hotline warm line column related to 911 and 988 um, coordination. Next slide. Some select ac accomplishments are for 2024. I already mentioned the learning collaborative that we did for our OWACBA, our trade association representing the alcohol, drug, and mental health boards. Uh, I referenced the work that we've been doing on the Lunch and Learn series for a couple of years. Um, we recently wrapped as recent as Friday, a, a very exciting uh, local systems assessment approach in one of our large urban counties here in Ohio, where using a, a tool and approach for a, a local crisis system matrix, we've significantly amped up how we conduct that work and uh, had some great success in working closely with local partners for their collaborating with their local partners to come up with a visible and accessible uh, view of the behavioral health emergency services continuum in, in that county. And last but not least, the crisis response pilot, um, which is the 911-988 uh, interoperability pilot that Cal is gonna be speaking about now. So I will stop and turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Cal Jenkins, uh, Assistant Director of Research and Evaluation with Clear Pathways. And like Alicia mentioned, I'm going to be talking about our crisis response pilot. Um, this was a year-long effort that actually uh, just wrapped up in August this year. And I'm excited to be able to share what we've learned so far, but also there's going to be a formal evaluation report that comes out in 2025. So we haven't learned all that there is to be learned quite yet. Um, but jumping right in, uh, we had five pilot sites throughout the state of Ohio. Oh, I'm sorry, can you uh, stay on the previous slide? Thank you. Uh, we had five pilot sites uh, that were throughout the state of Ohio. Um, each were required to have a working group that minimally included a 911 PSAP representative, their local 988 provider, and their local behavioral health board. And the focus of these work groups um, was to work toward facilitating warm transfers from 911 to 988. And we landed on that focus because ahead of this pilot, um, we learned that it's the norm or you know, more of the status quo that behavioral health call centers, including 988, 
do send calls to 911, um, but that the opposite was infrequent, that it's not the status quo that 911 can send calls to behavioral health call centers or 988 specifically. All right, next slide, please. All right, so our key activities, before I jump into these, I just want to acknowledge um, that all of these key activities were heavily supported by our implementation partners at Dignity Best Practices, um, helping identify what these key activities ought to be, um, developing content to support these key activities and being actively involved in all of the working group meetings. Um, but starting here with number one, building consensus. So like I mentioned, each of the working groups minimally had representation from 911, 988, and boards, which all have their own perspectives. So we wanted to understand what their motivations were for participating in this work, um, what their local goals may be, and um, just ensuring that there's alignment within this group on their current state and where they want to be at by the end of the pilot. Um, number two, understanding each other's systems. So really helping 911 and 988 understand each other's current call flow and using scenario exercises to help exemplify what that call flow looks like in real world situations. But I can't speak enough to conducting site visits. Um, many of the participants in the pilot acknowledge that as an unlocking moment for them, um, being in each other's spaces, particularly 911, getting to see the 988 call centers, understanding that they're not sending calls into a void that, you know, this is a call center somewhat similar to their own call centers. Um, and also this pilot was largely virtual. So the site visits um, provided an opportunity for folks to get together in person and, you know, help also um, foster their relationships. Um, number three, analyze and identify call types. So essentially here, just using data to help the work group prioritize what calls may be appropriate to start with in terms of transferring from 911 to 988. So that looked like requesting a month of data from 911 and 988. And on the 988 side, looking at what kind of calls do you currently receive um, and at what volume and what percentage of calls are going to 911. And it was really helpful for the 911 partners to get to see the breakdown of the robust, the robust types of calls that come to 988 and the low volume of calls that they end up needing to send to 911. On the 911 side, um, there was an example coding completed to show all of the calls that could potentially have a behavioral health element. And working from looking at that like example dashboard, um, being able to decide you know, based on the calls we've identified that are potentially behavioral health related, where do we want to start with collaboration with 988? And then lastly, developing protocol. So steps one, two, and three, all of these activities really built toward number four here. Um, each site, um, we developed a decision tree to help surface criteria for retaining or transferring calls. And then also using those decision trees for like the sites themselves to develop their own agency protocol, specifically PSAPs, developing protocol to transfer calls to 988. We also provided an MOU template at the end of this process such that all of the decisions made throughout this would hopefully be institutionalized by the participating agencies. Next slide, please. All right, like I mentioned, the evaluation is still underway, but these are just some quick lessons learned. Um, some of the key barriers, one, liability concerns. That's definitely expected. It's not specific to our pilot sites. It's not specific to Ohio. Um, but we did learn from sites that on the lower end, having state level guidance around liability or on the higher end state level legislation around liability um, would actually be something really helpful to alleviate that barrier. Um, also staffing and training needs. There's of course the training needs to help actually facilitate call transfers. But there's also needs, you know, for the folks showing up to these meetings to plan out what collaboration looks like. That's not really currently, to my knowledge, anyone's job. People are kind of having to step outside of their day-to-day -to, -day to do this work. And so we appreciate the time that people spent on this, but it's certainly a barrier that they don't have much dedicated time to contribute to it. Um, key uh, com competing priorities and differing philosophies of 911 and 988. So this is just to acknowledge that 911 and 988 are fundamentally different services. And as you go into collaboration together, there's just going to be things that come up that are kind of complex to work through. I like to use the example that 911 calls are recorded and made public record, whereas 988 calls, if they are recorded, they're certainly not made public record. And if we're talking about a warm transfer where these folks are on the phone with the caller at the same time, there has to be a negotiation there between their priorities and philosophies. And so just acknowledging, you know, even with your great relationships and great like 
intentions of making this work, you're still going to just run into these things that are somewhat unavoidable because 911 and 988 are fundamentally different. And so just acknowledging those um, challenges. There's so many things that come up similar to the recording example that I just gave due to 911's more public safety focus and 988, you know, being more oriented um, toward privacy and confidentiality. All right, but on the key facilitator side, I know it sounds obvious, but regular meetings and ongoing communication is super important. Um, it's it, <laughs> it directly competes with the key barrier of staffing and training needs. Um, but throughout the process, once folks did get into monthly meeting cadences, and once folks would get together one to one to meet outside of work group meetings, it really expedited the process. And then lastly, I mentioned this in the last slide, but examining 911 and 988 uh, call data together in working groups was super beneficial. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, and this will be my last lessons learned slide uh, before I wrap us up. Um, so the last slide was really talking about barriers and facilitators to the warm transfers to 988. This slide is really more so much bigger picture and just talking about the way that Clear Pathways has oriented ourselves, and when we talk about 911 and 988 working together. So when we started this work, um, you know, ahead of the pilot, in 2023, we really based this work on emergency communications interoperability. That's essentially the way that 911 agencies work together. That doesn't perfectly apply to the 911-988 space, but there's so much literature and resources to pull from that it just gave us a good base to start from. Our goals were also defined by a tool called the interoperability continuum that lays out five different components of interoperability, and we selected two of those components to be our key areas. Those are governance and SOPs. So all the activities that I talked about earlier really fall into those categories. But moving into 2025, um, we know that there's been work across the nation happening with 911 and 988, and we've learned from our own work as well. And so instead of basing our work on emergency communications interoperability, we'll base it on emerging knowledges, or excuse me, emerging knowledge and best practices around 911 988 interoperability. We'll still use the interoperability continuum to help inform our goals, but we'll, our goals will also be informed by the experience that we had with this crisis response pilot. And lastly, our key areas will keep governance. Um, we're going to expand from just SOPs to more broadly policy and procedure, which is much more encompassing. Um, and then lastly, training was not a piece of our, um, was not a key area we um, integrated into our work, and we want to integrate that into our site facing work in the future. Uh, next slide, please. And before we wrap up, just want to acknowledge our partners in this work. So, of course, um, there's Pew, who you heard from already and then aren't pictured here, um, but appreciate their support for this effort. Um, Alicia and I represent for Clear Pathways, an initiative of the PEGS Foundation. Um, we also have Dignity Best Practices, who are our implementation partner, and Mathematica, who is conducting the evaluation for this project that will be out in 2025. Next slide, please. And I know Alicia is going to be representing uh, for us at the round table, um, but here is both of our contact information um, for, for you all to have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cal, Alicia, and uh, Julie. Just really appreciate the opportunity to um, hear how you all are uh, having this partnership in Ohio uh, move forward. And it's just so important that we do bring all these stakeholders together. Um, Alicia, I just want to, I know you were in the presentation. If there was anything else you wanted to share before I um, ask some questions? The, the only thing I will share, and thank you again for the opportunity, and I always have to do this much to Cal's embarrassment, um, but Cal is the key factor in this pilot being exactly what it was and conceived of the uh, process and the tool that we could use adapting the Department of Homeland Security's interoperability continuum and then making it so that we could now have the results of our pilot to inform an interoperability continuum that's not just based in uh, public safety but also behavioral health. So always have to do that. Thanks a million, Cal, for the great work that you've done. Um, the only other thing I will say is that Ohio is an 88 county, 19 988 center, 217 plus PSAP state, and we are home rule. So it's imperative that we consider the realities of Ohio when trying to 
uh, understand first before regulating how 911 and 988 could collaborate. Um, so this is important for us and our hope is that the likely success of this work as uh, conveyed to us by the participants and our convening a, a, a week or so ago, which I see a, a lot of folks from on this call were actually in person with us when we unveiled a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, our hope is that we can encourage the development of some guidance um, for uh, promotion of 911 to 988 uh, collaboration and um, call transfers. The one other plug I wanna make on the work that we've done is it's because of Pew and the very rigorous research process that we can have um, confidence in the work that we've done. So coming up with an idea of, oh, it'd be great if we could do a 988 uh, or 911-988 call transfer pilot and see what that's like. But having first coming up with a kind of what's the logic model, what do we think it's gonna accomplish? Um, having a research plan and method, and then understanding the importance of having um, implementation partners and evaluation partners on top of all that really sealed the deal for us that this is the work that we need to continue doing, as, as Cal mentioned, um, not only in the current space, but ultimately in the training space moving forward. So thanks again, uh, Laura and the Crisis Jammers for the opportunity to talk about our work. Yeah, well, thank you all for doing that work. And my first question as someone uh, who uh, is, is interested in the public policy side of things, uh, and you mentioned the home rule, uh, you know, 88 counties, 19 centers. Uh, I see we have Doug Jackson from Ohio here who serves as the 988 um, lead. Uh, and so I wanted to see, like, what was that partnership working with with the state? Uh, you know, if, if you want to speak to that or, or Doug wants to speak to that, um, mm -hmm. how can others help? Uh, and what and, and is it important to have the state involved or is this something that you all did without that connection? It's very important. And Doug, I'm glad to see you come off mute. P please chime in. Hey, yeah, I was uh, not anticipating any spotlight, but happy to say that uh, the work together, working with Peg's Foundation and the Clear Pathways Project was not something that was a surprise to us. Uh, they talked to us in the very beginning about the idea of it. Uh, we engaged with Pew as well in some of those conversations. So just not being surprised is a starting place, but then the continued collaboration from there as to uh, the communities that were identified to really represent, you know, a, not just one type of community in Ohio, but a, a broad uh, group of different, different communities in Ohio. Uh, that was important for them to walk alongside with um, where the state is at for both 911 and 988. So myself as the 988 administrator, but also uh, the 911 administrator in Ohio, we were part of the conversations and updates throughout. And then recently even sat down at a uh, kind of wrap up session of all of those stakeholders who are involved in it to be a part of that conversation. What were the findings? Where are we going from here? So it, it's, been, it's been a good process throughout. Thanks, Doug. And sorry to put you on the spot there, but I saw you and I see another comment from a, another Ohioan uh, in the chat, Mike Hogan. Uh, didn't know if you wanted to make a, a, an additional comment around, um, you know, this project uh, and, and why it's important to bring so many folks together and do it in a real organized way. Okay, we may be having trouble getting Michael um, unmuted. Um, I also see that we have here Vibrant's own Director of Crisis Continuum, Amanda Miller, who specializes in helping folks uh, connect you know, the 988 Lifeline and embed that into their Crisis Continuum. As our feature presenters mentioned, crisis contact centers within the 988 Lifeline uh, do uh, reach out to their PSAP uh, colleagues but sometimes the PSAP colleagues aren't always aware of their local 988 centers. Uh, Amanda, do you want to say a few words here? This is what happens when you put folks on the spot. Um, well, I think this is so. so Laura, I'll just uh, I'll just jump in because I can't finally figured out how to do this. This is Mike Hogan, former former Buckeye. Um, I I think the uh, 
this the project has kind of unveiled something that in a way was obvious, uh, which is that um, uh, this uh, can't uh, proceed entirely. Uh, that is 911-988 collaboration without some kind of infrastructure and guidance. And um, uh, Cal and the team just did a, a, a great job of uh, bringing people along, participation, obviously a carefully structured kind of kind of process. We're not going to solve the, the connection needs of uh, hundreds of 988 centers and thousands of PSAPs without some uh, uh, some more consistent approaches like this. So it's a, it was a great effort. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Uh, if I could put one more person on the spot, because uh, I also see a comment in here from just an amazing legislator, uh, Representative Tina Orwell, uh, maybe talk to us a little bit of, about, um, uh, you know, the work and help facilitating uh, these conversations, particularly with the liability side of things. Can you hear me? Yes. You know, this was a piece around liability that um, came up pretty early in our 988 process because, again, these two systems have operated quite differently. And we're kind of asking 988 in some ways to operate like 911, including our rapid response teams. And so we did a pretty comprehensive bill looking at liability and happy to share it, but uh, we got a lot of input from. 911, 988, and our behavioral health system. Again, we want the clinicians and everyone working together on, in both 988 and 911 to know we're supporting their work. And we're kind of, it's new territory, right? So we want everyone to feel safe as they do this. And I, I think that has provided a, an important umbrella. Thanks, Representative Orwell. Uh, this is important work. This is, this is big items to get our hands around and it will look different for every community. So I think it's so important that you all did that work to bring stakeholders together and really in an organized fashion, as mentioned, to address some of these issues and then codify it. It's very difficult, uh, you know, when there are thousands of PSAPs that has been mentioned, I think over 6,000 indiv individual PSAPs, and there's not one overarching federal authority that can say this is the way it must be done, the way that 988 has SAMHSA to say this is, you know, what we are um, all going to be aligned to. So I just want to thank you all for that work, Alicia, Cal, uh, Julie, for helping to fund that. Um, any final thoughts before we uh, move to the next segment? Either of our, any of our featured presenters? Not for me, just thank you. Awesome. Any final thoughts, Cal or Julie? Just uh, encourage folks to reach out to me, Alicia, or Cal to learn more about the work. We're happy to talk at any time. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. Awesome. Any final, well, let's move ahead uh, to uh, our SAMHSA update. We have Dr. Belina Shaw with us today. Dr. Shaw, take it away. Good, good afternoon. Um, I am going to share some slides so I won't bother turning on my lights, um, but um, just wanted to update you guys on a couple of things this afternoon um, around SAMHSA. So the first I'll put in the chat is that November is actually Homeless Awareness Month, and um, the uh, team has created a toolkit to that effect. Whoops, I did not send that to everyone. Um, the team has put together a toolkit to that effect. And um, with, with Homeless Awareness Month, this is impactful and important because as we know, people with uh, that are presenting in crisis don't necessarily always have a specific mental health or substance use crisis. And often they can be social crises or the mental health or substance use crisis could be exacerbated by that social crisis. Um, and so um, working with um, partners and, home, and, and homeless services is a really important part of what we do. And I just wanted to make people aware of that toolkit. Um, there are specific dates with graphics and um, additional um, uh, uh, messages for the specific days that you can share with your partners. Um, let's see if I can share. 
Um, I also wanted to share um, about um, a federal advisory committee, actually, that um, we are engaged in at SAMHSA. Let me just make this. Um, it's called, should go back, um, and Joel is not with us, but he is my co-lead in this work, the Interdepartmental Serious Mental Illness Coordinating Committee. Um, it is focused on the needs of individuals with SMI and SED and how to coordinate care between and services and, and supports um, for these populations. And so um, just as we think about um, government and how one can get involved in government, um, some people that you know, I'm sure, are uh, members of, of the ISMIC. Um, but we have um, 12, and this is 12 federal members um, um, spanning from CMS, Social Security, HUD, education, et cetera. So 12 federal members. Um, and they um, are also joined by um, 14, statutorily 14, if I ever call, um, non-federal members, but that's a minimum of 14 non-federal members. And they come together and work on a series of topics that are indicated in these um, uh, graphical logos there. Um, SAMHSA, we at the bottom there provide the op operational support for these, we call these working groups. And um, Dr. Delphin Rittman um, is the chair and the body together of the non-federal members and the federal members together make up the ISMIC. Um, and so um, the ISMIC has a couple of main um um, I mean, elements, and I'm mentioning this because we actually have just released um, a new report, a 2024 um, report um, um, for the, um, the ISMIC, um, and they were, and Congress asked us to provide a summary of advances, um, a summary of, advan of research advances in SMI and SED, an evaluation of the effect of federal programs um, that have on these public health, on have, public, have on public health outcomes, and recommendations for actions that agencies can take to better coordinate the administration of mental health services for adults with SMI or children with SED. And um, this is a um, uh, just uh, uh, the cover of the report. Um, we have undergone some significant um, rebranding as well for the ISMIC um, because the ISMIC is not SAMHSA. So SAMHSA's mean primary color is blue, um, but we wanted to focus on some purple in there to uh, indicate recovery. Um, and this is the title of the cover, the report. Um, we have also now revealed a new emblem for the, the ISMIC. Um, it's purple with focusing on recovery. The outer ring um, obviously holds the, the title, um, but there's also this inner ring. And the inner ring here has um, three um, uh, figures that we are a representative of individuals that are in community together and have arms that are connected to the services and supports that are indicated by these um, rings here, the the. Um, rings. Each color it corresponds to the five working groups. Um, our five working groups are data and recovery, um, treatment, data and evaluation, treatment and recovery, access and engagement, criminal justice, and finance. And, um, and we actually have stewards that support the working groups crossing both SAMHSA and now the Veterans Administration is supporting as well. Um, and so I just wanted to, uh, actually, this is a great example in this in this presentation of sort of how how the work has trans translated from um, the um, the research to science that the RAISE, the Recovery After Initial Schizophrenia episode, um, is a uh, major um, study that was done by NIH created this EpiNet network um, to continue to, to build upon the research, created this coordinated specialty care model. Then the block grant set aside based on advocates um, was built in to be able to support funding the coordinated specialty care model and that, that there's been a broad expansion. We've done a, a, a paper on the financing and the broad expansion of coordinated specialty care across the community. But just an example of how SAMHSA has taken re uh, research and translated that to the um, breadth of um, services in the community, CCBHCs, et cetera, are all really important. What I also wanted to get to here um, um, is that we have a set in this, in this um, report, we also have a set of recommendations. And um, I don't think I was savvy enough to have the recommendation for 
2.1, although I have graphics that um, animation's not, not quite necessary. Um, but um, like, for example, uh, 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 recommendation 2.1 um, is um, focused on crisis care and creating and defining uh, a definition and standard for crisis care. And uh, John Palmieri, as you, you guys all know, um, and I and Jill Mays have been working on that work, and he'll present on the status of that next week and uh, give you a little heads up about when the public comment period will be opening. And um, and here's an, an example of the actual um, recommendations. The last was an actual a summary of some of the activities with some of the um, outcome um, or at least process measures from the um, the inventory of of relevant programs. So um, crisis care has been significant a significant part of this, and I just and I mentioned this here because um, not only did we have a meeting last week at SAMHSA's headquarters, um, our first one in person since the pandemic, but uh, I really do believe, and I've I've heard David Covington say it before, that really having this document uh, and these recommendations that have spanned from 2017 on to say that developing the standard for crisis care, expanding crisis care, have really been um, probably an unsung hero in the expansion of the work and really helping to, to, to catapult 988 um, um, out from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the um, ongoing catalyst of down, down, um, uh, uh, down the line service delivery. Um, and, and there's some description of some of the progress that's been made on the recommendations as well. So we do have a quarterly ISMIC newsletter, um, and there will be another um, ISMIC meeting. The ISMIC meetings are public. Um, they are available via telephone for, public, for the public, and you can provide public comment. Um, and we do read them, or um, if, if you don't want them to be read, they can be part of the public record. Um, but we do really consider them. We actually changed some of our presentations based on the public comment that had just come in and uh, making sure that we are um, responding to, to the public as part of the federal, this federal advisory committee. So that is just a little bit about our advisory council at SAMHSA, the, the, the ISMIC. Um, and I just wanted to give you a little, little update um, of some of the work that's been doing. And it was great. Uh, yes. Uh, David, do you want to say what you're saying in the chat? Yeah, Belaine, I just thought that the work that uh, ISMIC has done over the last, uh, gosh, going back to 2017, definitely helped lay the foundation for 988 and the national guidelines and the revision you're working on. Uh, it also really uh, helped uh, forge this even stronger partnership between feds and states around crisis care. Of course, Dr. Brian Hepburn involved from the beginning, but also now a member of, of ISMIC. It's a, it's a great effort. Uh, really have loved being a part of it. We appreciate your both of your energy and efforts in, in it. You, uh, we call you the OGs of the ISMIC. You guys have been with us since 2017, and we are appreciative of your consistent service um, as well over the years. Same update. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Really appreciate that update. Um, and folks, please do make sure you take a look at the chat. It is chock full of resources, links. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shaw. Uh, going to move on now to NASHBID, um, the National Association for State Mental Health Program Directors, uh, and their uh, update from their executive director, Dr. Brian Hepburn. Thank you, Laura. As always, you do a great job of facilitating, so thank you. Uh, thanks for the comments from David and uh, uh, also uh, Belina and the work at ISMIC. Uh, as David has said, it's made a big difference and provided that leadership. I wanted to say a little bit today, uh, I'm going to talk briefly, but I just wanted to say a little bit today uh, related to the election. We know that um, it's been a difficult time for many people. There was, well, there was a lot of stress leading up to uh, the ele actual election. And then we know this morning, there are some people that are more stressed. Um, so it makes me really reflect on the crisis services and the fact that uh, we've, we've all been pushing for increased availability for crisis services. And uh, wanted to thank the leadership of SAMHSA, um, Belina, the 988 team, uh, Dr. Delphin Rittman, uh, have been great at providing leadership so that when you look at the crisis 
services availability, we have more crisis services available than ever before. Um, so, uh, and I do, do want to say something about David Covington. David has been one of the leaders that has re really helped expand crisis services, the call centers, mobile crisis, crisis stabilization. So it's important for us to look at the funding and sustainability, making sure that all these good things that are going on will be sustainable. And it, it is important to reflect on the fact that uh, the one-time only funds like uh, the American Rescue Plan funds, COVID supplemental funds, uh, they were all very helpful at helping support 90-day crisis services, uh, get, allowing us to move ahead. But with, then we have to have sustainable funding. And the sustainable funding has come from CMS uh, through an enhanced match for crisis services, um, through the block grant of SAMHSA, but also through fees. And I did want to uh, emphasize a little bit that we've been working with states to develop a template that they may be able to use an updated template that they may be able to use for their own legislation uh, for fees. And uh, we're looking to those states that have been successful at developing fees, at implementing fees, to be able to help some of the others. Because although earlier there may not have been as much interest in fees, as states look at how much money is needed to sustain and the, looking at the braided funding in order to be successful, it may be an, there may be another opportunity to, to get fees passed in states. So we're, we're hoping to renew that effort. So with that, I'll thank all of you for your service and for the work that you do. And uh, uh, this, is a, this is a journey or the movement. Uh, we're just a few years in, we've got a number of more years, uh, some estimate another 10 years so that we really have good penetration but we're only successful if uh, we all stay engaged. And uh, I just wanna leave you with the fact that so much of this work has been bipartisan. We really expect that the work will continue and will be successful. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hepburn. And just wanna say a few words about your leadership. I uh, just really appreciate the work that comes out of NASHBID all of the papers, um, the model legislation, uh, you all are really at the forefront and very helpful in ensuring that the states are a part of this. So I just want to thank you as well. Um, okay, so let's keep moving forward. We uh, do have a very robust tech corner. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tina Soma. Thank you so much, everyone. My name is Tina Soma. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a research scientist and clinical implementation consultant over at Listen. Today, I'm going to be very briefly talking about AI bias. Next slide, please. I want us to first ground ourselves in thinking about AI as including a continuous evaluation and constant quality improvement. As we're building our models, our data will have some kind of interaction with humans, whether that be data curation or, for example, in the behavioral and mental health spheres, we have humans who are annotating and coding data for different types of mental health behaviors or interventions. That gives us, next slide please, what we call our ground truth. This is the basis for the data that's used to train our models and the pattern recognition that our model learns. The issue here is that the humans annotating the data carry their own identities, contexts, and lived experiences that influence the data. What can happen, next slide please, is that we see AI bias emerge in in things like mental health behaviors or medical diagnoses that are identified by AI models. Given that every AI model contains some kind of bias then, next slide please, I want us again to lean back on the fact that AI is about constant and continuous evaluation. So as we change as humans, our contexts change, our environments change, our models need to change with us. 
So what we've done in an, in an attempt to control for bias is to conduct bias studies. So over at Listen, what we've done is after collecting data, we have provided bias and multicultural trainings to our human annotation or coding teams. We've attempted to remove some kind of features of the data like audio or video that might have some kind of bias in the coder's interpretation of the data. That human annotated data is then run through our models and we compare the human annotation to our model ratings. We do these comparisons with a general population and then the subpopulations that we're examining bias. So that could be based on race, gender, or first language preferences, for example. If you're curious about how an AI bias study could be conducted, we uh, publish an annual AI bias report that's available on our website, and it's linked as a PDF below um, on the slides. So thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure to be here. You all are doing incredible and really important work, and we're always here to support the continuous evaluation and quality improvement so that the work that we're doing continues to get better. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Soma. Appreciate that. And if anyone wants additional discussion around AI, make sure that you go back to the Crisis Jam and take a look at uh, the vigorous debate that was around uh, AI in crisis services. But I'm going to move us forward because we have a wonderful guest here with us today coming to us from Australia, where I think it is 4 a.m. Uh, you can correct me on that if I am wrong. But please welcome uh, Sue Marie, who's going to talk to us um, around South and Southeast Asia mental health crisis care. Sue? Hey, thanks very much, Laura. Um, and thanks, everyone, for um, allowing me to join you today. Yes, it is very early in the morning, but I'm always happy to be here. Um, look, this week's Crisis Talk article, it's really was prompted by the substance that we had at the Zero Suicide International Summit the fifth international summit, um, and then the uh, third crisis, um, crisis care summit in Amsterdam. And it was really after hearing discussions from our colleagues in um, Asia about some of the challenges that, that they face in terms of providing crisis care. So that was the prompt for this article. And I think um, I had the opportunity to interview um, colleagues from Malaysia, from Indonesia, and from Bangladesh. And I think the first thing that struck me, of course, was just the sheer numbers of um, people that the Asian communities are having to, to manage in terms of crisis services. And I think across those three countries, there was sort of the, the landscape for mental health crisis care was really shaped by um, the cultural beliefs the healthcare infrastructure or lack of infrastructure, um, the policies and the access to services. Um, Indonesia was interesting because they um, really have very little by way of policy infrastructure um, that helps to guide their, their services. They're also a deeply religious country in that um, Dr. Oni, who I spoke with, said that really people would prefer to talk with their imam, their pastor, their priest before they would think about seeing a, a mental health professional. And they also do have a real um, deep culture of caring for their neighbour. So they've tried to, to pivot and focus their support services around building community capacity. But there are some real barriers in regard to structural deficiencies um, in the healthcare system that really do hinder their crisis care delivery. Bangladesh was completely the opposite. They have very strong um, policy direction, and they it, it was a hundred years between when they up created their first mental health act. And they updated it. So that was only done back in uh, 2022. So nearly 100 years before change in their in their um, legislative direction. But the challenge for Bangladesh, of course, is they have lots of policy, but the um, largely the population of Bangladesh is illiterate 
in regard to their policies. So they've got a really long way to go. But of course, they too rely very much on the uh, community volunteers and the family support. And they're really looking to strengthen their primary healthcare system um, by training non um, psychiatric medical doctors to also provide some mental health um, healthcare support. And then Malaysia, I think one of the things that struck me about Malaysia is that they had really only just decriminalised uh, the act of um, attempted suicide back in, in 2023. So they're really creating a major shift in their country about how they will manage uh, crisis services. They also have... Very you know, I'm going to have to interrupt you yes, just for we, one second. I'm so sorry. Down. Oh, sorry. No, get no, over, get over we're right at time, oh. but I do want to direct everyone to read the article because there's really great information in there. And thank you for joining Thanks, us so early. No problem. All right, guys. Well, we are coming near the end of this jam, but don't worry. Next week, we're going to learn about California services and evaluations from Dr. Mark Saville. And then the week after that, we're going to learn about intersections of indigeneity for indigenous populations and queerness from Jericho Covings of uh, Pathways Remembered or Paths Remembered. Really great. Uh, and then we have another debate coming up for crisis and peers. Uh, what is their role in crisis services, right? Are they incompatible or are they a core component? So this was a conversation that took place in Amsterdam. We will have that for you coming soon. So thank you all for joining us so much this week. Appreciate your time. Thank you for watching. Check out the resources on talk.crisisnow.com.